Welcome to Experiments in Leadership. I am Sonu Bhaseen. Experiments in Leadership is a space where industry leaders share their thoughts and stories about various facets of leadership. As always, before anything else, I do want to urge you to subscribe to my channel. It has great conversations with some really interesting people and the best thing is it is free to you. So go for it. So now to today's guest. Uh, Sandeep Koyal is a Chandigarh man who is also a gold medalist in English literature from Punjab University. And he has put his study of English literature to very good use and is a prolific writer who has written a few books besides many, many, many articles in newspapers and journals. And personally, I am a lot envious at the speed at which he writes. But more than as an author, Sandeep is known as the advertising man. And while he has done many audacious things as an advertising professional, the biggest of them all was bringing Densu Inc. of Japan to India as his joint venture partner. Now, Densu was the largest advertising company in the world. And then, along with Sandeep, the Indian company grew very fast and became one of the largest in the country in almost no time. And currently, Sandeep is back at Rediffusion, where he was their youngest president at 35 years of age, way back in the 80s or 90s. But this time, he's come back as the owner. Besides this, he also spends his time across many passions, one of which is food. His paratha parties in Bombay are well known. And you are a nobody if you haven't been invited to one. Now, thankfully, I have been invited to one, so I can say that I am not a nobody. So welcome to Experiments in Leadership, Sandeep. Looking forward to the conversation. Thanks, Sonu. Thanks very much. Thank you for inviting me. <laughs> Great. So, you know, when we were at MBA uh, way back in the 80s, we used to talk about a quote that was ascribed to you. And you were quoted as saying, I employ one man to do the work of two and pay him the salary of three. Now... Did you really say that? And did that work? I'm not sure, you know, <laughs> uh, how that quote has been twisted around. The only change that has now happened is okay. that I don't pay the salary of three, I say pay the salary of four because <laughs> there's so much more competition. <laughs> yeah, but you know, um, at that time we thought that it was very cool. I mean, we were all in our 20s and we said, Kaam to sabhi karte hai, but you know, if we get paid for doing uh, a little bit of more work. It was very good. So I had two questions around that. That is money a strong hold that leaders have over their people? And also in the current, you know, the so-called woke generation, uh, does that continue to be a, a, a very key factor when people are looking to work? And especially for leaders. See, I would never underestimate the value of money. Yeah. So that is something I'm very clear about. Yeah. For all these statements people make and, you know, the kind of posturing they do, at the end of the day, money is still a very important factor. Yeah. I think uh, what, however, we need to do is to temper that statement with saying perhaps a lot of it is also related to your station of life. Right. So in your earlier years, your more formative years, money has perhaps a larger role to play. Hmm. As you get older and maybe you have a slightly larger corpus of money to fall back upon, hmm. uh, maybe the need for money or your dependence on money hmm. does come down. Right? Hmm. But I still would under no circumstance underestimate the value of money, especially when it comes to being a function of work. So if you are working and you are underpaid, you are likely to be unhappy. If mm -hmm. you are working and you are adequately paid, my view is you are likely to be satisfied. If mm -hmm. you are working and the quote that you went back to, you are overpaid, it is a darn good incentive to stay engaged with the company. Mm -hmm. Because you think you are being rewarded or being perhaps disproportionately rewarded. So if you are working disproportionately and you are also being disproportionately rewarded, the, mm -hmm. the quantum of that disproportion is what you really have to look at. If you are mm -hmm. working twice as hard as everyone else, but getting four you know, times the salary of your nearest you know, peer, yeah. I am telling you nine out of ten people will be reasonably happy. 
I agree. And, you know, I do agree that you don't undervalue the, never undervalue the importance of money in, in life. But, you know, these days there is this trend. Uh, uh, people, I mean, I call them youngsters because, you know, I, you and I are older people. Uh, the youngsters are willing to shift uh, for, you know, 5% more salary, 10% more salary. Uh, in your experience, should people follow money or should people follow work? You see, I, I think uh, for all the kind words I may want to have, fact remains that I think uh, today's generation is even more mercenary than we were. So yeah. when we left, you know, management school, I mean, I today I complete 39 years of having started work to the day. Oh, so really? To, first June, first, of course, yeah. Yeah, first June. So it's very yeah. important in the life of most management trainees. <laughs> Absolutely. So we were mercenaries. It's not that we were not mercenaries. If somebody paid us, you know, a little more, there was always this temptation at least to switch. Hmm. Today, you're 100% correct. I mean, I, I have had people, I mean, this is, I was laughing with my CFO today. I said, hmm. yesterday we paid salaries. This morning, I'm sure we are going to have at least two or three resignations. <laughs> Yeah. So people have become mercenary to that extent ke if I don't, if I realize, if I resign on the first of the month when the salary has already been paid into the bank account, yeah. then at least, you know, the company owes me no money and I can walk away. Right. You know, it's right. become, it's become that cut and dry. So yeah. in my view, I think, again, it varies from profession to profession. We are right now talking more of the profession that you and I come from, which is a management and most people mm -hmm. we presume are working in the private sector. Hmm. I think uh, much of work has today become transactional. So in the old days, for example, you know, if you got placed at Hindustan Lever, knowing full well that it was not the most pushy job, it was still a very prized job. Yeah. Today, if you go into management school, and I have done that trip over the last few years repeatedly, hmm. you try and find somebody to work in a sales job. There's nobody available. Absolutely. They all want to go into consulting. They all want to go into, you know. Strategy. And, yeah, no, Strategy. for no other reason. I mean, this I, I this is, I am known for being very candid. Hmm. Uh, the reason is they just don't want to do any bit of the hard work. Mm. So I was talking to a guy we hired very recently and he's supposed to be heading up consumer insights and whatever. So I asked him, I said, so so-and-so client, I went, uh, have you been to the market? He said, no. I said, so, uh, you know, have you met their dealers? He said, no. no. I said, have you gone out with their sales rep and spent a few days in the market? He said, no. I no. said, then what consumer insights are you talking about? Yeah. So, you know yeah. nothing about the market and you know, you never really met the consumer. Mm. Maybe it's even more difficult to meet the consumer, but at least go and familiarize yourself with the trade. You'll mm. get many, many shades of opinion and many, many shades of, you know, feedback, which yeah. could be helpful in looking at, uh, you know, whatever is confronting the brand. Yeah. So the point is very simple. If you can sit in an air conditioned office yeah. with a nice, you know, Apple Mac in front of you. Yeah. Right. Why bother? Yeah, I mean, you're getting well paid. You're sitting inside a nice uh, yeah, office. Of uh, the air conditioning is working. It may mm -hmm. be pelting, you know, rain outside, but mm -hmm. you're comfortable inside. Why bother? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, the point is, if you are adequately well paid and you're in a comfortable job, for most people, that I think is good enough. I mean, quality of work, quality of learning, quality of you know exposure, quality of experience. Yes. To most people, it doesn't really matter. No, I completely agree with what you're saying, uh, Sandeep. That has also been my experience when I've seen uh, youngsters across the last 20 odd years. Now, I have two questions around it before we come to an experiment that worked for you and an experiment that didn't. Uh, one is that in this environment, as you've just described, which is more mercenary, more transactional, people not wanting to roll up their sleeves and get their hands dirty, how... Uh, it's more challenging for a leader. So how do the leaders who have to lead these kind of people, how do they manage? And two, from the point of view of the youngsters, uh, is it not a short-sightedness on their part to not invest their time into being getting some hands-on training? But first, just talk to me about the new challenges of a leader? See, I, so no, I don't think the challenges of the leader have really changed. Mm -hmm. You know, it is really uh, the shades of that leadership 
or yeah. the way you handle more of this transactional you know behavior yeah. is what you now got to come to grips with may so i, I think may I that... just interrupt you here may i just interrupt you here you know in the 80s and the 90s uh people like us who who were working at that time we were grateful to have a job because the options were less and therefore my hypothesis is that the leaders had a easier time because they knew that we weren't going anywhere but today the youngsters have so many options and therefore the leaders have to deploy many many more tactics or whatever they have to keep their flock happy i am going to answer that question for you a little differently han ji you told me you know storytelling is an intrinsic part of your show huh. you know i i went to meet uh, a client who had been making a lot of noise Hmm. So he was a very good client, nice guy, and uh, when I went to meet him, he was very agitated. So I said, "Why are you so agitated?" Hmm. So he said, "You know, the account director on your account, on my account, he's resigned, hmm. and the the creative director on my account, he's resigned, and and you know, uh, that girl, you know, the account executive on my account, she's resigned." Huh. So I looked at him. I said, "So they've resigned. No. So what can we do about it?" Huh. He said, "No, no, but you know, you got to do something about it." I said, hmm. "Listen, hmm. Uh, what can we do about it?" Now let's let's answer that question from a very simple, straight standpoint. Hmm. What do you think I can do about it? Hmm. He says, "Maybe you should pay them better." I said, "Sure." <laughs> what happens if I pay them double as much and the guy still runs away? Yeah. He hmm. said, "You should try it." I said, "Okay." The answer to that is very simple. You pay me double, I'll pay him double, and uh, we're both fine. He said, well, "How can we pay you double to retain your people?" I said, "But you're the one who insisting that they stay on here. You mm. got to live with the reality that mm. uh, in today's day and age, mm. attrition is a part of business." Mm. So he said, "No, no, 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 no." I said, "Okay, fine. Listen, let's not go into a unnecessary mm. argument." Mm. Uh, and uh, I said, "You were a year junior to me at management school." He said, "Yes, yes." Mm. I said, "I remember you were a fabulous quizzer." He said, "Yes, yes." You know, I won everything in sight. I said that's why I'm going to ask you the most difficult quiz question ever. He said, uh, "What?" Yeah. I said, "And if you don't answer it, boss, then you are not going to grill me any further." <laughs> He said, uh, "That's a strange one, but okay. Tell me what is the question?" I said, uh, "Have you heard the story of Ali Baba or Charles Chor?" Uh, so he said, "Yeah, yeah, of course, yeah. I mean, we've been uh, hearing that story from the time we were in junior school." Uh, I said. I am again asking you: Have you heard the story of Ali Baba or Charles Chor? He said yes. Hmm. I said fine. Now, now let me ask you the question. Hmm. The question is: Please name all the Charles Chor. Charles Chor. <laughs> He said, "What a stupid question, yar! How can I answer the uh, uh, Charles Chor?" <laughs> I said, "Boss, the point is: Now you tell me the account director who left. What was his name?" He struggled for a while. Couldn't really remember. I, I said, really? "No, tell me the name of that counter director." He said, "No, his name was Pramod." I said, "No, no, his name was not Pramod. It was Vinod." So he said, "Okay, it's the same." I said, "Okay, fine, it's the same." And what is the name of that girl who left? So he said, uh, "I think her name was Sangeeta." I said, "No, her name was Sunita." So I said, "The point is, point is much like the story of Ali Baba and Charles Chor. You actually don't remember the Charles Chor." I said, "Your Ali Baba is me." And I'm sitting in front of you now. Mm-hmm. As long as Ali Baba is around, उसके पीछे कौन चालीस चोर है ना बॉस? It doesn't really matter. <laughs> ये चालीस चोर तो आएंगे, गिनती में चालीस रहेंगे. I mean, what their name is, who the guy is, and where he is gone. I said you got to have a realistic view of the world, boss. The चालीस चोर will come and go. They are performing a function, and as long as they continue to perform a function for the time that they are in the organization, mm-hmm. you should. Basically, not have a reason to grip. Mm. But I don't know if it answers the question you asked me. But the point is mm. that uh, you know, in today's transactional day and age, mm. as a leader, I got to be practical, boss. Yeah. In the old days, if you resigned, mm. I remember. I mean, I was in my first job in advertising, and I put in my paper, and I was very good at my work. My client called me and sat me down and said, "Where are you going, boss?" Oh, right my boss called me my boss's boss called me because mm. i was quote unquote a precious resource mm. today i don't remember when i last had a chat with somebody who wanted to leave mm. 
Because mm-hmm. as it is, I have now figured out nine out of ten chances a guy is going to leave in any case. Cause. In any case. There's no point wasting your time and your money and your efforts in either trying to increase salary mm-hmm. or to give the guy a new designation because you might keep him back for three months. Three months later, somebody else is going to dangle a better bait. The guy mm-hmm. is going to be gone. Mm-hmm. Even practical, people have to move on. So you, if you're smart enough, you perhaps need to maintain a reasonably good bench strength, mm-hmm. which means work shouldn't suffer. Which means if you require, say, 100 people, you need to have 110 people available at any point of time. Factor mm-hmm. in that 10% extra as a cost that you just have to take today. Mm-hmm. Right. You know, Sandeep, that's why it's such a pleasure always to talk to you because you present such a different perspective on any situation. And yes, I mean, this is a different perspective. Uh, and uh, it does force me to think about attrition and people differently. Uh, so the Alibaba bit is important. Uh, Charles people, the, they can come and go. But, okay, so I'll hold on to my ne- uh, other question. But do you want to talk about an experiment in leadership that worked for you? Or See, I, I really don't know what leadership? the answer to that is because I'm sure you had many, many people on this show. But no, I... Has, uh, something that, you know, you still remember as something that worked for you. I'm sure there are many things that worked for you, but... No, no, I, I give a very, very simple example. Yeah. You know, when uh, first thing is, I think I'm going to pull back a little from your question. Hmm. I think uh, in my, you know, now 40 odd years of working, I have hmm. almost an equal split between being an employee and being uh, an entrepreneur. Employer. An employer. Hmm. I won't say employer, but at least an employee versus an entrepreneur. entrepreneur. Hmm. Right? Yeah. So first I must answer to you, you know, in that, whether it's leadership or it's your style of management, hmm. you know, uh, somewhere during that halfway mark of my career, hmm. I kind of figured that, uh, and this is a very important dimension actually hmm. for employees. Hmm. I kind of figured that if I'm making so much money or I think in my mind, I'm making so much money for the organization, hmm. right? If hmm. I made a small fraction of that for myself, I'll be a rich guy, hmm. right? Hmm. Hmm. So I think lots of people have asked me in the, uh, in the past, what is the trigger for, you know, kind of moving out from being an employee to becoming an entrepreneur? Because say at the position that I left, I was group CEO of Z. That year I was India's highest paid professional CEO for a listed company. And right. it was a shitload lot of money that I was making, you know. Right. Now, right. why would you want to give up a job which fetched so much of money and had so much of stature hmm. and now want to be an entrepreneur? Hmm. The only answer to that is I, I figured for myself, right or wrong, I don't know, hmm. that I was making one hell of a lot of money for hmm. the company. Hmm. Now, if I made a small fraction of that money for myself, hmm. I'd be a very rich guy. Hmm. Hmm. So, whether it is an experiment in leadership or not, I decided to try my luck in terms of being an entrepreneur. Hmm. Now, again, when trying to be an entrepreneur, hmm. I had two choices, hmm. which is, should I set up an agency? Because that's the business, only business I knew, which was advertising, right? Yeah. Yeah. Should I set up an advertising agency and call it Sandeep Goyal Associates hmm. and I have 100% of it? Hmm. Or am I willing to kind of forego my ego, of putting my name or on the nameplate outside hmm. and partner with someone much bigger Hmm. which allows me to continue to play in the A-League that I'm so used to. Right. Which is how Dentsu came in. Hmm. I mean, it took me, it took a lot for me to woo Dentsu and bring them in into India as my joint venture partners. You know, they were undisputed, still remain undisputed world leaders in advertising. They're by far number one. The Western yeah. agencies don't compare anywhere close to what the Japanese are. Hmm. Right. But making that willing choice hmm. where I said I'm better off being 26% of Dentsu in India hmm. versus being 100% of Sandeep Goyal Associates, hmm. it may not be leadership, but it's a very, very important dimension of the way you look at potential business. Right. Right. Hmm. So, the learning from that, you know, uh, yeah. Well, I believe a very pivotal decision mm-hmm. in my professional life mm-hmm. was that you got to sacrifice something if you mm-hmm. really want to play for something much bigger. 
Very important, yes. Yeah. And you sacrificed a bit of your ego and totally. A lot of your ego, boss. There's not a bit of your ego. <laughs> a lot of your ego. Thank you for being so honest, Sandeep. <laughs> no, because traditionally, adhesions, if you look at it, if you look at, you know, Bottle, Bagel, uh, BBH, which is Bartle, Bogle, Hegarty, or you look at DDB, hmm. Needham, or hmm. you look at J. Water Thompson, or hmm. Ogilvy. Hmm. Adhesions have traditionally been run with the name of the man who owns hmm. the show, uh, hmm. you know, on the name plate hmm. outside. Hmm. For you to therefore have a setup where I, you know, it's a Dentsu Communications or Dentsu hmm. Markom or Dentsu Creative hmm. without having your name on the nameplate, despite the fact that you are the one who's driving the growth, you're driving all of the, hmm. you know, uh, the standing of the agency. It hmm. takes a lot. I mean, it's not easy. Hmm. And, uh, you know, sacrificing that hmm. is actually much bigger than the sacrifice you perhaps make on monies or any other hmm. thing that you do when you turn entrepreneur. Hmm. Mm, I know, but look, it was a success. And even though your name wasn't on the on the marquee board outside, but I think everybody knew who was driving that business. But you know, you touched upon this ego and you know the name on the board, and you also work with a lot of celebrities in helping them create their brand. And I think your doctorate is also was on something around celebrity brand building, wasn't it? Yeah, it is on celebrities as human brands. As human brands. Now, in that, you would have worked with a lot of leaders, a lot of sports people, a lot of stars, a lot of, you know, when it comes about their brand. In your experience, for all these people, what is the leader's biggest fear and biggest wish when it comes to their own brand? Very simple answer, boss. The biggest fear is the fear of is the fear of failure. Failure? Yeah. Failure. So Howsoever big you are, I mean, I've dealt with some of the biggest industry, you know, doyens of industry. I've dealt with the biggest of stars hmm. and at very close quarters. Hmm. You, know, hmm. you may be, whoever you are, your biggest fear is fear of failure. So, uh, just talk a little more about Failure, you know, what aspect of failure? Because fear is... I, I, I'll, I'll play that back for you a little differently. Hmm. You know, I don't know if you were watching the, the IPL matches in the last few days. I haven't watched this. Well, it doesn't matter. I mean, it's... A, you know, a stadium full of 100,000 people chanting Dhoni, Dhoni, hmm. Dhoni. Hmm. I went to Lucknow, uh, you know, halfway through the IPL and... Uh, went down to the uh, see the match where Lucknow was playing. So it's not even Dhoni. Mm. And the whole 60,000 people in that stadium or thereabouts chanting mm. Rahul, Rahul, Rahul. Mm. Right? Mm. The biggest fear of mm. the celebrity is mm. one day the chants are going to stop. Stop. Yes. They'll be Understand. silent. Nobody will recognize them. No. And I have met, I you know, I have a very close friend of mine. She and I were traveling one day Mm -hmm. uh, by Shatabdi from Delhi to Chandigarh. Mm -hmm. At one point of time when I was in college, she was the prettiest you know, girl in Chandigarh and then she went on to make her name in Bollywood and she was mm -hmm. very famous and whatever. I think... Now, I of course... Know. Now, of course... Mm -hmm. you know, I think I know who you're talking about. But yeah. anyway... Yeah. It doesn't matter. I mean. mm -hmm. So we were halfway through that train journey mm -hmm. when some lady stopped mm -hmm. and she looked at her and she said, are you so and so? Mm. I cannot tell you, Sonu, the <laughs> happiness on oh, no. yeah. yeah, Just to be recognized, forget everything else. Mm. And then the lady went off, you know, she didn't ask him. And, they, you know, this is a few years ago when, when selfies were not that common. So she came back five huh. minutes later and this time she turns around and I was the only person sitting next to her. So she says, will you do me a favor? Will you take a picture of me with her? Oh, right. So I obliged. Mm. And then seeing her taking a picture, other people must other have been people. chatting. Ki ye hai. Mm. Right? Mm. And then, well, a half a dozen people kind of came by to take a picture with her. Mm. Right? Mm. And I cannot tell you how happy, how delighted she was mm. to be recognized mm. once again. Yeah. So fear of failure doesn't even mean fear of fear of failure in the sense that you know mm. uh, you fail. But fear of fade out. Because eventually that has to happen to all of them. Yeah. 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 
and you know i see all these books behind you and mm -hmm. uh, well at least some of them uh, i can tell you i have seen them at the peak right i have seen a lot of them not being anywhere close to the you know mm -hmm. uh, heights that they were on as right. as right. you know groups or as companies yeah. or whatever yeah yeah so even in business i think the biggest fear mm -hmm. is the fear of failure okay if i can just use another word uh, sandeep failure or irrel of fear that i will become irrelevant so a ceo who there can be many dimensions to failure yeah so we are not getting into that hmm. but broadly if i can understand the basic theme of the discussion hmm. is that i am no longer the focus of attention uh, right right you understand you yeah. get so used to it you know i mean mm. we talk of paparazzi only from the standpoint of celebrities mm. but you look at it if you run a huge empire and i mean i work with some of them mm. very very closely you know mm. when you are managing director you are chairman mm. and managing director mm. you really have the world at your feet and then something goes wrong i mean it can take 10 years 20 years 30 years mm. and yeah. uh, you know from being the prima donna of the business mm. that you were Hmm. now other people have suddenly raised a head of you inched a head hmm. of you whichever way you want to put it hmm. Hmm. and you are no longer the focus yeah i mean it's most most visible to me when if i end up at a fiki you know event or at an right. asocham event or whatever yeah guys who till 10 years ago were the guys who were sitting in the you know front row mm -hmm. and had 20 people crowding them around hmm suddenly are trying to catch the attention of the new heroes right right so i think when it comes to celebrities in any shape or form hmm the fact that you will no longer be the center of focus hmm. is i think the biggest fear hmm. so you know staying on the theme of leadership and you know the biggest fear of a leader being of that of failure and you know all of the trappings going away how can a leader prepare himself or herself to deal with it because you know the day you join a company you know the day that you're going to retire and if you retired as the md ceo the neck i mean the moment you your farewell is over people stop being interested in you how do you prepare yourself how can leaders actually prepare themselves if at all they can the honest to god answer is you can't i mean you know i am at that age you're a few years younger Mm -hmm. and the last you know year year and a half two years i've had some of my closest friends who were pillars of bureaucracy yeah right yeah now forget the corporate world at least in government they all knew what was the retirement date right right and i tell you most of them mm -hmm. without too many exceptions mm -hmm. just can't come to grips with the fact mm -hmm. that they are no longer who they were till mm -hmm. a few months back yeah right yeah. so the inevitability of it hmm is something that i think as human beings we find very difficult to come hmm. to grips with hmm when it comes to the corporate world i think it is more obsolescence than even uh, the fact that you hmm. know uh, the inevitability of retiring hmm hmm i mean i have friends who are now uh, running large companies but they are already talking about the fact when you know my innings here is over i want to get on to the boards of other companies mm. and then therefore you know whatever whatever mm. my point is is it really necessary mm. like, one can be philosophical and say boss you had a great innings now mm. let somebody else come and have their you know right to bat yeah. but i suppose it is the human uh, you know side of all of us mm. where we don't want a good thing to end yeah mm. I, i mean if on if you look at it from one angle yes why should good good things end but the definition of good things change with our stage of life uh at least that's what i believe that you know what was a good thing of life say 10 years ago may not be such a good thing for me right now but yeah i want good times to continue but the yeah, definition but so of good night times have changed for me so no you see what happens uh, with a lot of us hmm is that we don't prepare for that moment of reckoning hmm you know we don't build hobbies we don't build interests we don't build you hmm. know distractions hmm. outside of what is the narrow confines of work very true very true you understand 
Yeah. I mean, I, I I was asking a friend the other day. Went into his house. He had a beautiful, well-appointed, you know, library. Forget everything else. Hmm. So I said, so do you continue to read? <laughs> so he just looks at me. He says, uh, don't, <laughs> don't, don't, you know, poke fun at me. I said, why? He said, the library has also been designed by someone, you know. <laughs> Yeah. So books that you see there, which look mm. fairly erudite and look mm. very, very knowledgeable, mm. people have stopped reading. I mean, they maybe never read after they passed out from college. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I asked another very close. I mean, I I'm in that habit here. I'm in that business. If you don't chat people up, you mm. don't really get a perspective. Mm. So I asked somebody. I said, "Do oh, last one some movie dekha tha?" Mm. Struggled. Really? Struggle mm. to answer a simple question like, mm. what is the last movie you saw? Mm. So after some thinking, he tells me I was on a plane, you know, I was going to New York and I saw this movie on the plane. Mm. And means mm. not even taking time out mm. for mm. these simple pleasures of life. Nice. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So I suppose when you know you're faced with, as I call it, the inevitability that you life has to move on. And mm. you as part of that life have to have a finite end, at mm. least when, you know, work is concerned and so on and so forth. Mm. I think very few of us actually develop that. interests which are beyond the confines of work. Yeah. Yeah. No, so again, if I can just paraphrase a lot of what you have said is that as a leader, it's important to not have a unidimensional life. Work is important. You know, work is need to be passionate about work, but also prepare for the afterlife. I mean, at a philosophical level, we all in, in our scriptures, in our spirituality, we do say that we need to prepare for the afterlife. So at work also, you need to prepare for afterlife, uh, you know, maintain social relationships, don't give up on friends, have hobbies, spend time with family. Otherwise, when you find you have a time for family, well, the family has got used to not having time with you. So it is, it is. Okay, so I know we are going past our time, but just one last question, since it is about uh, an experiment in leadership that did not work for you, would you like to talk about any? See, that's a more difficult question to answer than the earlier one. I know. But, uh, yeah. but go for it. You know, uh, as an entrepreneur, I had some learnings. Yeah. You know, my, my mother was a very senior IS officer. And uh, I think uh, she was more, more than anything else, she was my philosopher and guide. Hmm. And uh, she used to have this very interesting anecdote. Hmm. And she said, you know, Muhammad, uh, Mahmood Ghazni came to India. Hmm. And uh, he was coming from Persia and whatever. Hmm. In the very first war that he fought with the Indians, hmm. as he was entering what is now Pakistan or Afghanistan or that area, hmm. the first very, very first day he had, he was massively routed, you know, beaten up so badly hmm. by the Indians. Hmm. So at the end of the first day's, uh, you know, battle, hmm. he got his generals together and he said, what happened boss? How come we've hmm. been winning everything and how come we've got completely beaten up today? Hmm. So they said everything was fine, except that we we had horses hmm. and the Indians had this massive creature called the elephant. Elephants, right. Yeah. Hmm. So he said, yeah, yeah, I saw that massive thing that was kind of moving around, you know, the uh, battlefield. What exactly is it? So they said, hmm. it is, it's also an animal. It's hmm. called an elephant. Hmm. So he said, I want to see what an elephant is all about. So an elephant was summoned. Hmm. So... The elephant came and, uh, you know, Mahmood Ghazni looked at the elephant. He was quite fascinated by the elephant. Hmm. And he asked to sit on the elephant. So, you know, uh, he was hoisted up. Hmm. He sat on it. Hmm. Once he sat on it, uh, he looked around, pleased, very pleased because he now had height on his side and, hmm. you know, whatever. So, he looked down and he said, okay, now give me the reins. Hmm. <laughs> so, he said, no, 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 boss, in the case of uh, an elephant... Uh, the Mahout sitting downstairs, he's the one who's guiding the elephant. Mm -hmm. You just sit up there and you either, mm -hmm. you know, guide the, you know, mm -hmm. soldiers mm -hmm. or you can, you know, fire your arrows or whatever else you want to do. But you don't have control of the elephant. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. So, Ghazni said, stop 
and I want to get off the elephant. So he got off the elephant. Hmm. So he said, uh, so he asked him, say, why, why you got off the elephant now? Hmm. So he said, जिस चीज की लगाम मेरे हाथ में नहीं है वो मैं कभी भी आई एम नेवर गोन राइड इट सो इन मेनी इयर्स ऑफ नाउ वर्क आई हैव लर्न दैट इन वट एवर एंटरप्राइज यू डोंट कंट्रोल द रेंज ऑफ द एंटरप्राइज थिंग्स आर लाइकली टू गो रॉन्ग सो इन माय वेरी मेनी इयर्स ऑफ नाउ बीइंग एन एंटरप्रेन्योर आई हैव फंडेड ए नंबर ऑफ एंटरप्राइजेस आई हैव गॉट इनटू पार्टनरशिप्स Mm-hmm. i have brought on board people who were perhaps far more you know learned in that domain than i was mm-hmm. but wherever i have partnered with people and not kept management control mm-hmm. we have always lost in that partnership mm-hmm. so it may be an extreme case of you know a learning but mm-hmm. i am telling you wherever we didn't keep financial control wherever we did not keep you know mm-hmm. management control board control Mm-hmm. end result of those businesses was never positive mm-hmm. yeah yeah very 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 insightful ki lagam hamesha haath mein honi chahiye only then will you be able to so uh, yeah mm-hmm. bolo nahi i mean uh, you know that lagam is also symbolic it is actually no, i agree is, lagam is symbolic it is but you know the basic fact is that If you are running a business, be in control of it. You know, never uh, abdicate uh, the responsibility. If you, you yeah, if you abdicate that responsibility, or you yeah. fight shy of it, or you say, "Nay, yeah. nay, we are in a partnership, so you mm-hmm. know somebody else will run it." Mm-hmm. My my own personal learning, almost hundred on hundred, mm-hmm. wherever we have not exercised, you know, control, control in terms of running the company, the mm-hmm. end results have not been positive. Yeah, got that. I think valuable lesson, and I know that we've shot way past our time. But as always, such a pleasure always to speak with you. Well, thank you for inviting thank me. It's been you. so nice to interact with you. And, we'll and I'm very impressed with the you know collection of books that you have behind you. And we have a mutual admiration society because I am like really jealous at the speed at which you churn out your articles for Business Standard. No, but now you know, last last week I I launched my ninth book. but this time around i have promised myself yeah. that the tenth has to be a work of fiction because non fiction all of us can write <laughs> you know the true test of a writer is actually fiction so okay. the tenth book that i am going to come yeah. out with hopefully uh-huh. is going to be a novel great good so i will talk to you more about that uh, offline but viewers keep watching we'll continue to have many more conversations until then bye sure.